welcome everyone to AER Live, a new series of in online interactive workshops from Applied Ecology Resources or AER. I am Dr. Florence Danetti, Associate Editor of AER's Associate Journal, Ecological Solutions and Evidence, and I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today. AR is a globally accessible open platform that makes preserving, sharing, and discovering applied ecological information easier for everyone in the ecological community. So we're broadcasting this free online workshop for applied ecologies around the world as we prepare for the launch of our fully searchable database. Ahead of AR's launch, we have made available a host of other resources, including education materials provided by the Evidence Conservation Teaching Initiative, this is a global team of conservation educators who are providing resources to help teach evidence-based conservation. All materials are freely accessible, permanently archived, and many have been translated into multiple languages. So please visit our AR website to find out more. I would like to thank our sponsor, Wildlife Acoustics, for this month's AR Live, the relaxing nature soundscape uh, soundscape you heard before the start of the workshop was recorded by today's sponsor who create the world's leading bioacoustic research tools. So more details of their services, including free training courses, will be provided in the slide at the end of this presentation. And I'll shortly hand over to our speaker, Professor Hugh Possingham, who is giving today's talk. But before I do, uh, here are some housekeeping rules. Um, this workshop will be recorded and posted online, so please keep your camera and your audios off at all times. So check that they are all muted. And please submit any questions you have for our speakers using the Zoom chat box, and we'll ask some of the questions during the Q&A at the end of the talk. So without waiting any longer, let me introduce today's speaker, Professor Hugh Possingham, and his talk. What is the value of monitoring, evidence, data, and science for nature conservation outcome? So the floor is yours, Hugh. Thanks, Floor, and uh, thanks also for um, hosting this event, and thanks for everybody coming along. Uh, I'm going to start sharing my screen, and it's going to come out to full screen, I hope. And I'm going to talk about uh, one of my favourite topics that uh, the, the warning is that um, if you uh, love science for science's sake, then I might say something that's going to offend you. So I'm talking about um, the value of, of science, the value of monitoring, the value of evaluation, value of recording stuff. Uh, but I'm talking about purely in the context of conservation outcomes. So this is a talk about what does science and monitoring do to deliver outcomes on the ground, which is things like you know, saving species. So at times I will have some uh, slightly anti-scientist offensive language. I do love science, pays my salary. Well, sorry, I do like science, I, I love nature. Let me, uh, without further ado, just go into a couple of examples of what I'm talking about. So often in my work over the last 30 or so years, people have said, once I knew I was interested in monitoring, uh, can you tell us about some interesting monitoring strategies? And particularly, we might have a protected area, say in the Gulf of California or any other part of the world. In their area, they're worried about climate change. And so they think that the marine species are going to head towards the poles. And they say, let's design the best monitoring strategy for our species in our marine protected area to detect climate change. And these are environmental NGOs, these are applied groups, government officials. This isn't a science question. They're doing stuff to save species. And so I say to them, why? What are you going to do? Generally, we have now have a thousand studies that show that most of these species will move to the pole, but even if they're not, and even if they're staying still or they're going round and round in circles, you can't really do much about it in terms of your particular marine protected area. So that's one case where I said to them, why not monitor something that you can do something about? What about monitoring water quality? And if you find that's having a very bad negative effect, then talk to the municipalities about their sewage treatment. What about monitoring the big fish? Because if they're declining, maybe there's poaching and you need more patrols in the protected area. 
Similarly, being a spatial planner, I'm often asked, told by many groups around the world that the most important thing for spatial planning is to gather more species distribution data, to resolve more taxonomies, to work out where every species of weevil is. And with no disrespect to the weevil taxonomists of the world, you have a very hard job. But bottom line is the return on investment from those activities in terms of building protected areas is at the moment negligible. We've done study after study showing that that sort of information is making almost no difference. And if anything, I would just suggest you gather more socioeconomic data, not more ecological data. And then, of course, my favourite one is the people who, uh, who love to catch, tag and torment and probe various threatened species to save them from being caught, probed. I don't know what they're saving them from, but uh, often that science can be very useful, but often they work out things like territory sizes or movement rates. And the connection to action on the ground is either non-existent or extremely vague. And one has to worry then about the consequences of those activities. So our group has thought a lot for a long time, me and my friends, um, about why do people monitor and do research? And we've come up with about eight reasons, but I'm really going to focus a lot on uh, around two and three and maybe a bit of four. But there's other reasons to monitor. For example, often people monitor environmental interventions because they're being audited. So the government says, here's some money, plant some mangroves, did the mangroves grow? That's fine. Uh, it may be a useful question and sometimes it has to be done. State dependent management is often extremely useful. Useful, For example, many of the world's fisheries have bycatch. And if they're catching a particular kind of fish and the bycatch is a threatened species, like a, like a dolphin, or a seabird or a rare species of fish, we often find that on real-time monitoring of that bycatch is essential. And if you suddenly find, and this is true in places in New Zealand, I know, if caught three hectares dolphins, the entire fishery closes. So the best, I think some of the best monitoring is monitoring that's set up. So while it's happening in real time, it actually delivers an action in real time. I'm going to focus a lot on three and four about monitoring that actually delivers better outcomes. There is five, learning for learning's sake, and we've often found almost all learning has eventually become useful. There's also a lot of reason to monitor in terms of just informing the general public. That's our job, uh, raising the profile of, of threatened species, raising you know, the, ge the general monitoring that we've found around the world of the broad scale declines of invertebrates, for example, Again, it's not necessarily leading to a very particular local action, but it is staying to inform the, the policies on insecticides and getting a lot of people concerned about what are the fundamental causes of these broad scale declines. Engagement, one of the best reasons to monitor is get people out in the field. Actually getting people monitoring with you is a wonderful thing to do. And of course, sometimes we're just monitoring stuff. We have no real purpose, and I do a lot of it myself, bird watching, entering eBird data, and sometimes you just see things that happen to be remarkably useful. When I'm talking about optimal monitoring, what I'm going to do is putting monitoring in my favourite framework, which is a decision science framework. Most of our group's work has used decision science to optimally allocate funds to actions in space. This is a bit different. We're now thinking about how decision science can be used to allocate funds to monitoring and science. And if I say that to a statistician, environmental monitoring and optimization, they immediately tell me they have this sorted. And how do they have it sorted? They can very quickly produce these statistical power graphs. Remember what statistical power is, I always forget. It's the ability to reject a false null hypothesis. It's the ability to reject a false null hypothesis. So somebody says logging does not hurt a particular species of owl or cockatoo or whatever uh, and somebody says well I think you're wrong so you need a monitoring strategy that has a fair chance of rejecting that uh, null hypothesis and you can devise multiple sorts of monitoring strategies using helicopters, on-ground surveys, camera traps and you can look at investment in those monitoring strategies this is money now along the x-axis 
And generally one finds that the more money you spend, the more statistical power you have, that is the ability to truly reject a truly false null hypothesis. And then you would say, given that information, if you had a certain fixed budget, we could look at these two different monitoring strategies. One might be a survey of fishermen, one might be satellite data or catch data. And you'd say, in this case, with this amount of money, we should do the blue monitoring strategy. Or you can also use these money versus power curves to get a predetermined level of statistical power that might be, say, I want to be 80% sure that I reject a false null hypothesis um, for the cheapest amount of money, and then you choose the purple strategy. So that's good, that's well known, uh, and that's great, but it suffers from a few problems. One of them is, and I'm going to talk mostly about this, what if we spend all that money just doing more management? And why are we trying to disprove this null hypothesis that logging doesn't affect the cockatoo? So the one revelation we had early on when we were thinking about this, um, Scott Field, a former postdoc, and, and Drew and Nicholas and others, we realised that the way we set up null hypothesis is, hypotheses is heavily biased against the environment. So usually people say, prove to me that logging kills, just reduces koala populations. Prove that to me. And they say you need to be 90, we don't want any type one errors because that would cause us to stop the activity when they really weren't declining. And then of course, the other kind of error is that we do some analyses of logging and the impact on koala populations. We don't have much statistical power, so we can't disprove the null hypothesis. Often statistical power is very low, whereas the type one error is, very, is maybe set way down at 5%. Our ability to reject a false null hypothesis may only be 50-50, and then we fail to stop the activity. And this heavily biases um, uh, uh, activities towards failing to reject a null hypothesis and therefore not knowing that human activities are causing impacts on the environment. In fact, the best way is to look at the two costs of those two types of error, both economic and social costs, look at those two costs and then balancing the error to be proportionate to those costs. So what you actually need to do is say, if the type two error is egregiously huge and is gonna cost us millions and millions of dollars, then we wanna make that really, really small. The type one error is actually not a problem at all when we just stop the logging in a few places and it doesn't cost a lot of money, then we should probably set up very high. So this whole 5% thing is flawed. And for some reason, my slides are not progressing Oh, there we go, they are progressing. That's when your cursor is not on your PowerPoint. So bottom line, message number two, if you're into optimal monitoring, you can actually optimise it, but don't always set the type one error at 5%. Now I'm just gonna tell her, this is a random set of papers and pieces of work we've done over the years. I'm gonna tell, tell a couple of stories here about um, how we think about optimal knowing or optimal knowledge gain. The first one's probably my favourite one, that work done with Hedley Grant. Um, and we were looking at uh, building protected area systems in, um, in South Africa, in the Fynbos, in that incredibly rich part of South Africa with thousands and thousands of endemic plants. The proteas are a very rich group, uh, over three or 400 species. And we asked the question, imagine you knew nothing about where proteas were and you knew nothing at all. And you started building a reserve system in South Africa solely based on vegetation types and altitude and rainfall and soil. And you build a representative reserve system. Well, if you did that and you conserve 20 or 30% of the region, as we hopefully now like to do, how would you go? Well, you would miss a lot of proteas because the proteas aren't always responding perfectly to those uh, environmental drivers and you might miss 20% of them. Then we ask the question, what happens if we waited for one, two, five, 10, 20 years to gather information about proteas and we spent money gathering information. There aren't that many people who can actually collect this data. And we found amazingly that because habitat destruction is going on at such a pace in the 1980s and 1990s, and this is happening also in many regions around the world still, if you waited to gather more protea data, you will definitely get a better reserve system. So once you had more data on where the species are, you built a better representative reserve system. But in fact, 
because you were losing options all the time, uh, it was only two years of protea data, which was about 10% of the protea data South Africa already had it in hand. Only 10% would be worth collecting from scratch. So remember when you're collecting data, you possibly not making other decisions. And the one thing I get very, very frightened about is when uh, politicians say, we can't make a decision that's good for the environment. And this is a version of the precautionary principle because we don't uh, know enough data. So the, the, the precautionary principle would say, no, we should act now because we need to and we'll wait to gather the data later and maybe refine things in the future. But often as scientists, we get trapped into this mess where we're encouraged to gather more data and we like that because we get some money to gather more data. But in fact, the decisions aren't being made and as decisions aren't being made, uh, the fish stocks are declining, the species are disappearing, options are being lost. And in fact, what we come up with in the end is not optimal. Um, I might also recommend looking at some of our work on harvesting kangaroos or moose, Sweden and Australia, where often uh, you want to keep a population in a narrow band. You don't want too many or too few of these species, too many, you may hit lots of cars, too few, and they're threatened with extinction. And then often we find that annual monitoring, which is what many countries are locking into, are, is, are not essential. And you could just monitor these stocks, if these stocks of moose and kangaroo every three or four years and gain, get the same amount of outcome. And the cost would, would be much diminished because you're not using resources all the time. So I'd encourage you to look at some of those a wide variety of papers about monitoring. So what can we do then up front to look at the value of science in a broader sense? And this comes into the field, which is a fairly specialised field, but it's starting to grow a value of, value of information analysis. And I think Mike Runge's paper there down the bottom is, is a hard paper to read, but is one of the very best and the seminal paper in the field. And what is value of information analysis? And probably this, this, this set of slides or this one slide is the most important thing I can tell you. So often we, let's say, are trying to uh, recover a threatened species. Uh, mm -hmm. And we're looking at that threatened species and we might run some population viability analyses. And then we might say, well, what should we do for it? Uh, well, first off, um, we might like actually have no actions we can take, a bit like the species, marine species that's being affected by climate change. We can't reverse climate change in a particular marine reserve. But let's say we have one strategy, strategy A. If we run our population models and we have an uncertain parameter, we will realise that the benefit of strategy A varies a lot. And if the, this particular parameter, let's say it's adult mortality rates, is high, the strategy is really good. If this parameter, adult mortality rates, is low, the strategy is not so good. But of course, you know, you might say, I really need to know how good this strategy is. You don't. You don't need to know how good it is because it's the only strategy you have. Do strategy A. You don't have to resolve that uncertainty. Silly example, it is amazing how often people try to find information where there's no chance of changing their strategy. You might say, well, I've got actually two strategies. One might be putting out nest boxes. Uh, one might be planting trees. Strategy B and strategy A. So strategy A is planting trees. Strategy B is putting out nest boxes. Well, again, if you actually find that strategy B is always better than strategy A, you don't have to resolve the uncertainty in your parameter. Even though you're making wildly different predictions about the fate of this species, it doesn't matter. Strategy B is always going to be the best strategy. So again, boring example, but run your models, you don't have to actually gather more data and do more research on some issues. If they do not change, what is the best thing to do? Of course, it gets a bit more interesting when the value of the uncertain parameter, adult death rate, or often actually it's a movement parameter for many species, if that value of that parameter would, if it changed from high to low, the best strategy would change. But in this case, the the difference in the benefit is so tiny, we're assuming the strategies cost the same amount or being scaled to cost the same amount, the, the difference in benefit is so small, the amount of money and time and effort you put in resolving our certain parameter may not be worth it. It could be, but it might not. 
Of course, the most interesting case is this case, and this is where the information is so important, and this is what I would wish more scientists would do when they're studying threatened ecosystems, species or processes, is they would look at the different strategies and they would show that the different strategies performed incredibly differently uh, given if the number that they know a lot about changes a lot. They don't know a lot about changes. So if this uncertain parameter was very high, strategy A is 10 times better. If it's very low, strategy T B is 10 times better. If we don't work out what this uncertain parameter is, if we don't, if this could be a process, it could be any sort of science, if we don't resolve this scientific issue, then we do not know what to do. And the benefits of resolving it are enormous. So this is really the bottom line. Um, when you're doing monitoring research for applied conservation, you know, is the research going to lead to a new action? Maybe. Uh, what is the chance that the research actually changes what you're doing and makes it significantly better? And finally, the really hard test that nobody wants to talk about is the benefit of that changed action much greater than just doing more management. So we could just keep doing strategy A and because we're spending more money on it because we're not doing science or research, then maybe we're just going to get a better outcome. And knowing that strategy B was better doesn't work. And that is my dog. It's uncontrollable, so I won't try. So bottom line is one thing to think about, you know, and this isn't always true, of course. Uh, many, uh, many, many times uh, uh, you could spend that science money doing more management. And this is a, 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 a challenge that many applied agencies are faced with. Of course, in some cases, the budgets are completely separate. Then I'd ask why are they completely separate? And as I say, in the end, and there's a lovely paper by Eve on this, uh, it is sometimes just best not to do any monitoring at all. Um, so uh, what would be happier stories about the Gulf of California and marine reserves? As I say, think first, not about what you know least about. So the most interesting questions are not always the most important questions. The most important questions are sometimes incredibly boring. And maybe in these marine reserves, you could just monitor the algae, which would tell you about eutrophication and nutrients, and that can actually help you change policy in local municipalities. Uh, maybe an interesting question, if we're building a reserve system in a very poorly known area like Gabon, um, then you could, instead of saying, let's just gather more species distribution data, let's more gather more data on, on um, resolve some of the taxonomy, maybe you should just say, which of those species do we know so little about and where are the places that we could look for those species would most likely change our decisions, not build better species distribution models, but most likely change our decisions. So this is where it's tricky if you evaluate your science in terms of the likely outcome it delivers through a decision-making process, I'm not saying that's easy to do, rather than evaluating your science in terms of how likely it is to resolve knowledge, to resolve uncertainty and increase knowledge. And they're two very different things. Um, I haven't talked about active adaptive management, uh, and some of you will already be thinking, why can't we learn while doing? And that is by definition, active adaptive management. That is where you actually manage systems and learn simultaneously. And of course, that is one of the best things you can possibly do. It is quite hard to do. Uh, for example, again, in marine reserves, uh, the ability to move the boundaries of any protected area is, is not an easy thing to do. So it's not something the public likes you to experiment with. Some things, however, like a lot of pest control can be experimented with. And while you're actively managing a pest or, or a pest or an invasive species, you can be trying some different options. The interesting thing about that, that is there are optimal ways of doing that learning. And there is a trade-off between the best experimental design that maximizes knowledge gain and the best experimental design that maximizes outcomes with a bit of knowledge gain. And I recommend you read that paper by Mick McCarthy. So you can optimally do of adaptive management. Um, I think I've said a lot of these things. Uh, maybe I should 
ask us why have we ended up in a situation where we are confused about some of these issues is probably because we largely taught statistics in the context of pure science, not applied science. Now, that's not bad. <clears throat> uh, null hypothesis testing, analysis of variance, they're incredibly important tools for the progress of human knowledge, but they are not particularly useful in general for advancing applied science, where in fact, you generally don't wanna be testing null hypothesis. You wanna be looking at the, the, the size and statistical significance of interventions, which of course of what applied ecology is all about. I've ignored a couple of things. I've ignored the fact that sometimes you study certain species and you learn things that help other species. And that is an important reason to do science on these species. So sometimes, we accumulate knowledge that benefits other locations quite often. Don't forget this. I'm not saying don't monitor with community groups because the benefits of monitoring, I do it a lot myself, with community groups are often education and engagement and serendipity. But think about what really your objectives are. And I really see a monitoring strategy being very clear about those eight reasons I spoke about at the top. I haven't talked a lot about the negative impacts of science and monitoring on species, and don't ignore them. Mick McCarthy has a great paper on the impact of toe clipping on frogs and reptiles, and that is a disturbing paper to read. And so, again, I would just encourage everybody who's thinking about monitoring, evaluation and research, particularly monitoring, to be very clear why it is or isn't some of these things. It doesn't need to be all of them. It only has to be one of them. And once you've worked out which one it is, then think about how you design it to optimise that purpose. If it's about engagement, maybe you design a monitoring strategy that makes people happy, makes people smile, makes people want to go in the field. If it's about informing the public, maybe you do it on charismatic species. If you're looking at logging, then you want to pick a species that people will relate to. And so, therefore, you may not pick the most sensitive species or the most important species. You may pick the species that's most likely to deliver you the outcome, which was a change in policy. Um, and I'm happy to wrap up just there and answer any questions. And I'm going to stop sharing and I'm going to hand back to the masters. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It was a very interesting. Uh, presentation. Let me check. We have already some questions. So some congratulations about the talk. Okay, so the first question is, is there much evidence or anecdotes about area management struggles to actually monitor anything given resource constraint, budget deadlines, etc? I mean, yes, I mean, the, the one I think I understand the question, but the one reason why I think people don't like my talk is because a lot of the time we've spent really getting annoyed with governments, particularly government, saying, why aren't you monitoring any, anything? So to be honest, um, even though I've just given a whole talk about all the reasons why you may not want to monitor, we generally don't monitor enough. So across the board, uh, many interventions are made by environmental groups, by NGOs, by community groups, and there's no monitoring whatsoever, none at all. Uh, and, and that's, you know, even very, very simple cheap monitoring would be very, very important. Um, so I think, uh, uh, you know, we are guilty, I think, of not investing enough, broadly speaking, in monitoring. Um, uh, and most parts of the world, uh, it would be nice if governments set aside 10 or 20% of their funding for monitoring. And probably that's a roughly about how much it needs to be. That said, I don't think it should be 60 or 70% in general. Perfect. So we have another. Uh, so these are two questions that are a, a bit related. But uh, first one um, asks, why don't funders and the public claim for meaningful evidence? Wouldn't that drive funding for monitoring? It, it, it would, and of course, it is very disappointing. It's incredibly disappointing that um, humanity has, a, has seems to have a changing view of evidence. I would have to say that COVID maybe has helped to increase society's interest in evidence, 
because we get a lot of evidence and we see lots of graphs and we ourselves, uh, well, imagine having the data on wildlife that we have on COVID. I mean, literally in many countries, we're tracking the number of infections on a daily basis with an accuracy mm -hmm. in some countries of maybe two or three percent. I mean, you couldn't dream of that data for, for wildlife, could you? So we're making real life interventions about lockdowns and immunizations based on real time data. And so it's a pity, maybe, that nobody has actually talked about the cost of that data and how it was collected. And the fact that health agencies all around the world have been trained to enter and record very rigorous data on diseases and mortalities. Um, and that's never questioned. And in fact, if they didn't, we would be appalled. You know, I have people come up to me and say, you know, Hugh, you've been in ecology forever. How many echidnas are there in Australia? Or how many platypuses are there in Australia? I don't know. I don't think anybody knows. You know, it's a big continent. How many echidna biologists do you think there are in Australia? How many people are counting echidnas? And how hard do you think it's going to be? So it is funny. The public actually think we are out there gathering huge amounts of systematic data on species and habitats, and we're not because we it's a very expensive data to collect. Um, so, yes, I mean... The evidence revolution, I mean, the, the British Ecological Society and this, this new organisation aspires to, I think, is very important. And we should demand more evidence. But also, we shouldn't just force people to monitor things to death. So, again, I've seen examples in Australia where they spend 30 or 40% of their budget on monitoring a three-year program on revegetation, when, in fact, after three years, you have no idea whether you've succeeded or not. You really needed 20 years. So I would rather have seen them spend a lot less money over a lot longer period of time. So where we go wrong, I think, is, is we don't monitor for long enough and we don't monitor things that are cheap to monitor. Cheap and long is the best mm -hmm. way to go. Yeah, that's very true indeed. So uh, it's another question related to the funding. Uh, and it's very interesting, I find it uh, in general. So I've heard that funding for research is often biased towards what is trendy right now. Does it have an impact on our ability to look at the important questions over, over this interesting question or publishable questions? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. There's no doubt about, about it. There are there are trends, there are fashions in science as much as there's fashions in fashion. Uh, and that's not good um, because uh, what that generally means, and, and it's particularly true for countries like Australia, which have very irregular season. We, most of our variability is, is over a long period of time not seasonal variability, whereas in some parts of the world, seasonal variability is most important and there's, most years are somewhat similar. In our part of the world, it's, it's every year seems to be very different and there's five, 10 and 20 year climatic cycles. So yes, you need to be doing things for a long time and nobody gets more than five, maybe a, our biggest schemes are seven year funding schemes. Our biggest schemes are seven year funding schemes. So I think it was, um, Jim Brown I spoke to once, Jim Brown, probably one of the most famous living ecologists uh, from Arizona, and he had some field sites. He's got 30 years of, of um, detailed desert ecology on ants and rodents and seeds, and he said that the, the pain he had to go, go through to continue to collect that data is enormous. The first two rounds of National Science Foundation funding, I'm probably getting this story wrong, but he, you know, he got five years, he got five years because he asked new questions. But then you go through this dip of mediocrity when you've mined your study system for all the interesting questions that can be asked about it, the, the, the faddish, fashionable questions for four to five to ten years. You're not really a long-term study yet. So some of those unusual events that might happen after 20 years haven't started to happen. Um, and so you fall into this pit. And, and for those people I know who have managed to maintain long-term monitoring uh, off short-term grants, 
So occasionally people get long-term money. I think some of the Northern European countries are the best at doing this. Australia's terrible at doing this. Those people who have managed to do it, often they find after 20 years, they suddenly get this new lease of life because they have one of the longest-term meaningful data sets. I'm facing it myself. I have a 20-year data set from near Adelaide that's done by a community group. It's 160 sites visited three times a year, and we just ran out of money after 20 years. And it's the only long-term regional multi-species data set in a state of South Australia, which is about the size of France and Germany put together. The only long-term monitoring multi-species monitoring program in an area the size of France and Germany. Yeah. Um, so we, I have so many questions. It's so difficult to choose. So I'll go for Michelle's question. Um, so she asked, how do we convince local managers about the necessity for management of our recently introduced invasive species if we, don't know, we do not have any data on the species' local impacts? In a, mm. So she means in a preventive approach, we yes. should not wait for the species to establish and yeah, yeah. like to convince the managers to do something. Yeah. Well, you know, and I speak on this issue from a very much a person who lives on an island, a very, very big island, but Australia's ecology is very much like the ecology of any island, a Pacific island or whatever. Our policy is if something new arrives, uh, we kill it as fast as we can. The trick is finding it. That will kill it because uh, it, and, and it has anything that could be perceived to be an invasive characteristic, like anything in the composite, any daisy, we're going to kill that. Any mammal, we're going to kill it. <laughs> any vertebrate, we're going to kill it. So, so uh, it, it would have to be quite benign for us not to kill it. The trick is finding it and so that we don't need to do any testing. And so I, I would encourage most countries to do the same. And even at a regional scale, if something turns up that's entirely new, you know, I don't think you'd have to do much, too much studies on it. You just need to make sure it really is invasive. You make sure it's not a threatened species that you hadn't otherwise found. But once you know what it is, um, and uh, it looks as though it's about to spread quickly, I would, I would you need, really need countries to have uh, rules and laws and people in place to, to have the autonomy to remove those species as fast as possible. The other rule of thumb is if a species, a plant species occupies more than 100 hectares and three locations, it's almost impossible to get rid of. And that's not a lot, 100 hectares and three locations. And that's Australia's track record. We just can't get rid of things that cover a bigger area than that. Yeah, I agree with the approach of Australia as an invasion ecologist as well. So, uh, oh God, sir, so many good questions. Uh, so this is from Paul. Performing power analysis is sometimes beyond the expertise of conservation mm -hmm. NGOs and outside the understanding of less technically trained decision-making colleagues. Yeah. Uh, are there any tools or resources to bring it uh, closer to reach of less academic pr practitioners? That, I mean, yeah, and power analysis. I mean, I must admit, I think somebody had to explain it to me 25 times before I even had any idea what they were talking about because of this whole type one and type two error you know, hypothesis. I, I don't think there are many great tools. I'll, I bet, well, somebody can put something in chat if they have and could be added to the bottom of the slides. I think it's really conceptually difficult. What I tend to do is, is try to give people worked examples. So instead of doing a fulsome power analysis, I run them through mental uh, examples. So some I say to them, well, you know, if, if you're treating area A, if one area with a, a herbicide A and one area with herbicide B, and you have 10 plots of each, um, you know, do you think, if there's only uh, you know a seventy percent chance A is better than B, do you reckon ten plots is enough? And you just just show them what it would look like by using a random number generator. So I, I, I it's like doing statistics by example. So let's assume that A is better than B seventy percent of the time. Let's do it ten A's and ten B's. See how often A beats B, and you find out 
what beats B three times more than B, three to one. But occasionally, if you have a random number generator, you might find A and B are roughly the same just by bad luck. So you still say, well, probably with that difference, 70% better, 30% better, we probably need 20. So, you know, you can, I, I think uh, it's statistics by case study with something that is relevant to them and using a, an Excel random number generator or something to just simulate the outcomes of interventions where, where you're not always going to get yes, no answers. So that's my only advice, which again, um, uh, still requires somebody who's a bit of an expert. Thank you very much. So maybe this is the last question. Um, so Hernan asks, how do you see the future of conservation in a post-COVID era? Era, sorry. And how do you think yeah. already scarce funding should be allocated in an ideal world? Yeah, um, uh, good, good question. I mean, scarce funding is a big problem and there's lots of answers to that question. Um, and I, I, I didn't go through them all without offending lots of people. I mean, there's some no-brainers like, I think, empowering Indigenous people in a lot of tropical countries to have the control of their own land. I think, you know, that's probably one of the most appealing things. A more focus on plant diversity and involving communities in protecting rare and threatened plants, I think is a really important one. But in terms of a post-COVID world, I, I mean, I think we have... Some advantages is that people are starting to see the world unraveling, the narrative around diseases coming out of the interaction of humans with wilderness areas and destruction of forests being related to emerging diseases is a good narrative, and there's a lot of evidence now behind that. Um, but also, uh, uh, I, I think more people got out into nature. They certainly have in Australia, and I think when the lockdowns stop across much of the rest of the world, people will start to appreciate getting out and, and their mental health. And I can tell you my favourite bird watching spot, which I went to for 15 years and hardly ever saw anybody. On last Sunday, I went out there with a friend and there were 75 bird watchers there <laughs> in the first hour and a half of the morning. And I could go there alone. So uh, there's a lot more people out enjoying nature. They're wanting to... So I think we need that. That's where I see the hope is harnessing that enthusiasm for nature, uh, digital cameras, and, and really, in the end, being a public servant now, I can tell you one thing. Politicians are not stupid. They're, they're a bit slow, but they're not stupid. Politicians do what the majority of the public tell them to do. So there's no sometimes there's no point lobbying a politician when 50% of the people want us to act on an issue generally politicians will start to act because generally in a democracy they're populists and populists act when there's lots of people yeah thank you very very much for your presentation and all the Thanks. questions you answered so there are many many more uh, that will be forward to you and really really good questions sorry that uh well we couldn't answer all of them and i'll share my screen again Thank you very much, Hugh. A pleasure. Okay, so that brings this month's ARE live workshop to a close. Thanks, Hugh, and everyone who joined our talk today. Next month's workshop also seems quite nice. So it's led by Dr. Kustov Sharma, a researcher from the Leopard, sorry, from the Snow Leopard Trust. Kustov's workshop will be focused on his theme from practice article about the ethical use of camera traps in the field, which was selected as an editor's choice article in Ecological Solutions and Evidence. So more details can be found on our website and registration for this workshop is now open. So for all of you who have been following the Ecology Live talks last year, good news. Ecology Live will be also returning from next month uh, for another exciting new series of talks on the latest ecological research. They will be broadcasted every Thursday from 4th of March to 20th of May. So please visit our VAE, uh, 
BES website to find out more and register your interest. And finally, I'll leave you with the details of today's ARE live sponsor, Wildlife Acoustics, as well as creating cutting edge recorders and software for monitoring and analyzing environmental sounds. Wildlife Acoustics offer a range of free line, online sorry, training courses, video tutorials, and much more. It sounds really great. So please visit wildlifeacoustic.com forward slash resources to find out more. Thanks again, everyone, for joining us today and hope to see you next month. Thank you. Bye-bye.